Welcome to Worship This Day with Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Somerville, New Jersey. I am Pastor Chelsea Miller, and it is my joy to welcome you as we worship and praise our Lord today. We continue in our Pentecost season, and we start a new year of the narrative lectionary today. So we are headed back to Genesis, and we will make our way through the Bible throughout this year. We gather in the name of God, our creator, Jesus, our savior, and the Holy Spirit, our advocate. Amen. Let us pray together. Merciful God, you created people not as subjects to rule, but as partners intending and enjoying this beautiful earth. Help us release our shame and guilt over what we have done wrong, accepting instead your mercy and forgiveness offered through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This is a reading from Genesis, and that is how the universe was created. When the Lord God made the universe, there were no plants on the earth and no seeds had sprouted because he had not sent any rain and there was no one to cultivate the land. But water would come from beneath the surface and water the ground. Then the Lord God took some soil from the ground and formed a man out of it. He breathed life-giving breath into his nostrils and the man began to live. Then the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and guard it. He told him, you may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. Now the snake was the most cunning animal that Lord God had made. The snake asked the woman, did God really tell you not to eat fruit from any tree in the garden? 
We may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, the woman answered, except the tree in the middle of it. God told us not to eat the fruit of that tree or even touch it. If we do, we will die. The snake replied, that's not true. You will not die. God said that because he knows that when you eat it, you will be like God and know what is good and what is bad. The woman saw how beautiful the tree was and how good its fruit would be to eat. And she thought how wonderful it would be to become wise. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband and he also ate it. As soon as they had eaten it, they were given understanding and realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and covered themselves. That evening, they heard the Lord God walking in the garden and they hid from him among the trees. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 11th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God. Amen. Once upon a time, there were two dogs. Both dogs enjoyed going to the park. Both dogs enjoyed playing. And both dogs had owners who took them to the park on a regular basis. But the dogs were also very different. The first dog wore no leash, but nevertheless stayed close to his master's side. When the owner found an appropriate spot in the park, he gave the dog permission to run and play, which of course the dog did without hesitation. But when the owner saw a flock of birds land on the far side of the field or a bicyclist ride past and realized that his dog had seen them as well, he quickly called to the dog to come. And the dog, who had his eye on those birds, immediately responded to his master's voice. It was clear to any observer that as the dog played, he understood and honored the boundaries his master had set for him. The second dog, unlike the first, was on a leash, and it was quickly clear why this was the case. This dog, who some would describe as a free spirit, was jumping all over the place, pulling his owner in every direction but straight. He too had seen the flock of birds in the field and strained to get to them. After that, he yanked his owner toward the pond, then to chase a bicyclist. The whole time his owner, like the first owner, would give verbal commands to the dog, but the dog was unfazed. The owner knew he couldn't stop and let the dog play, so he continued down the path on his way home. So of these two dogs, which dog was really free? Which dog enjoyed genuine freedom? Now, I think most of us have probably heard something about this story that we heard today. Adam, Eve, the serpent, the fruit, the garden, all of these are a part not only of this story, but they are a part of our cultural heritage. We've seen this story and these elements in art, in children's books, even in TV commercials. But how do most people view this story? I suspect that many people see this as a story in which God is some kind of cosmic killjoy or spoil sport, a divine party pooper, if you will. For them, God comes across as merely a stern rule giver. And when Adam and Eve don't conform, God punishes them for not falling in line. Some might admire the human beings here as nonconformists. For the more religious, this story might simply be seen as a reminder that we better follow God's rules or else face the consequences. For still others, this story has little relevance to their everyday life. Today, I want us to consider this story more carefully. I believe there is much more here than people realize. But to do this, we need to know more about this story's place in the larger context of the Old Testament. Though it's not often a question we ask, we need to think about who this story was written for. In all likelihood, it was originally a story that was only told verbally. But at some point, it was written down in the form that we find here. Why? What purpose did it serve? 
Well, if we were to fast forward through the book of Genesis and then follow the unfolding story in the book of Exodus, we would discover that everything that is being written is for one purpose, to give a specific group of people an understanding of why things are the way they are, to confirm that there is a God who has made promises to their ancestors that God wants to fulfill in them and through them. The people, of course, are the Israelites, and their leader was Moses. This is the audience for whom the story in Genesis 2 and 3 was written down. Genesis 2.16 is the first time that some form of the word command is used in the Old Testament. That's important because the command that God gives here is the very thing that is called into question in chapter 3. At first, it seems that the serpent is calling into question the reality of God's commandment. Did God actually say? But by the time we come to verse 4, we see that he is really calling into question not the reality of God's command, but the rightness of God's command. The author here gives us no clues about this serpent. All we know is that he was created by God, along with all the other animals, but that he was very cunning. Notice that the serpent is trying to convince the woman that God is lying to her and trying to keep something from her, that God is acting out of jealousy or selfishness, not love. The serpent is trying to convince the woman that God is not trustworthy. We need to see that as the woman ponders the serpent's statement, her reasoning is being driven by one desire, to be wise like God to be like God. And when she eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in direct disobedience to what God has said, she confirms that she has not only doubted God and God's goodness, but she believes she should be God's equal. It's not completely clear what the purpose of this tree is. As God confirms later on in chapter 2, these first humans did become like God in some sense because they now knew good and evil. But as we see, unlike God, given their nature, this knowledge is not something that these humans could possess without disastrous consequences. And according to verse 7, the first consequence of this new wisdom was a sense of shame because of their nakedness. When they disregarded God's command, something happened in how they understood themselves, how they understood one another, and if we were to look ahead, how they understood God and their relationship to God. And if we were to finish chapter 3, we would see that God's word comes to pass. Even though the man and woman did not drop dead in the exact moment of their disobedience, they did pass from life to death in that exact moment. In the blink of an eye, they were cut off from the life-giving presence of God. The timer began to count down. They were now spiritually dead, and their new spiritual death would eventually lead to physical death. There is no way to minimize the seriousness of what happened here in Genesis 3. The entire remainder of the Old Testament and the New Testament, all of it, is devoted to describing how God fixed what was fractured here. The world is the way that it is because of what happened. Death and suffering and human evil flow from this moment. But at the heart of this temptation is the question of true freedom. Even though the word freedom is not mentioned here explicitly, it is central to this story. Based on what we've seen, when are we truly free? What does it mean to be perfectly free? To do what I want, how I want, whenever I want? Does genuine freedom mean living in a world free of rules and restrictions? This is where it's important to understand for whom this story was written down. The Israelites were being led out of Egypt and into a land that had been promised to their ancestor Abraham. Like the Garden of Eden, where God walked with man, so too would this promised land be a place where God would dwell with God's people. But if these people were to live as God's people, then like their first parents, they would have to live according to God's rules. 
This is why God gave Moses a law that the people should live by. As Moses tells the people in Deuteronomy 11, You shall therefore keep the whole commandment that I command you today, that you may be strong and go in and take possession of the land that you are going over to possess, and that you may live long in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give to them and to their offspring, a land flowing with milk and honey. Do you see why this story in Genesis 3 was written down for these Israelites? Their original parents were removed from God's presence because they disregarded God's command, and now they had the chance to once again dwell with God with all God's blessings if they would just listen to God's voice. God did not give up on humanity. God was working to reverse the curse. Like the first woman and the first man, the Israelites would also be tempted to choose the way that seemed right to them, the path that seemingly allowed them to be in control, to be like God. But isn't that where all of us are? All of us are consistently tempted to believe that real freedom means freedom from restrictions and freedom from us having to listen to anyone else or freedom to do what we feel is right. But when we talk about God's commands, we're talking about something different. We have to remember why God gives us rules. God defines our boundaries not to restrict without reason, but to liberate us so that we might enjoy the fullness of life that comes when we are in right relationship with God. Think, for example, of an astronaut who has the opportunity to do a spacewalk outside the ship. The astronaut does not complain that the tether that connects her to the ship is too restrictive. No, she is incredibly grateful for that tether because it allows her the unique privilege of seeing our planet from a perspective that few will ever see. She knows that if that tether was not there, yes, she would still have an incredible view but she'd have that view as she floated off to her death into the quiet darkness of space. Let's be clear. Mere conformity to God's rules is not what brings us life. What brings us life is being in right relationship with God. And being in right relationship with God leads to obeying God. Why? Because being in right relationship with God means we understand that God is God and we are not. And because God is, we trust that God always has our best interest in mind. So, do we believe God's commands are for our good? That they actually liberate us to know life, real life, according to God's design as the creator? What does it mean to be truly free? The dog from the original story that is really free to enjoy life is the dog that listens to his master's voice, not the so-called free spirit who lives according to his impulses, but is consistently choking on the leash, missing out on what it really means to live. To know the freedom of listening to God's voice, we must first know the freedom of grace. The one who was truly free made himself a slave in order to give slaves like us the freedom we desperately need but don't deserve. So I wonder, are you walking in the freedom that Jesus makes possible? The freedom of forgiveness and grace? Because you are, are you listening to God's voice? Do you see God's commands as liberating for you? Freedom in Christ is not simply freedom from our past mistakes. It is paradoxically the freedom to be servants of Jesus. Through Jesus, we can walk with God forever. Not in a garden and not on any soil from this world, but as the book of Revelation tells us, we will walk in a new heaven and a new earth. And in that world we will once again have access to the tree of life, the very tree from which our first parents were barred. Through Jesus, God has and will continue to reverse our curse. Amen.
us profess our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Apostle Paul reminded members of the church at Rome that all human beings are sinners. We all give our loyalty to goals and purposes that fall far short of the will of God. We are all tempted, as was Jesus, to live by society's standards, to substitute material gain for spiritual integrity, to call attention to ourselves rather than take our place within the body of Christ, to align ourselves with the power brokers of our day rather than recognize a higher power over all things. Let us come to God, recognizing how unworthy we are to approach the one who embraces the universe, yet believing we are known and welcomed in this awesome presence. Let us confess our sin. God of all time and space, we have joined our ancestors in seeking to live our own way. We have been tempted to play God with our own lives and those of others. We have confused freedom with self-indulgence. We have sought to make decisions that are not ours to make. We have put down others to gain status for ourselves or have accepted the hierarchies of the world as God-given when they are not. Forgive us, O God, and equip us for clear thinking, honest response, and loving service. In Jesus' name, amen. The abundance of God's grace is freely given to you this day. In Christ we have known the reign of God's righteousness. God also lives in us. Receive this gift with joy and thanksgiving, praising God for the new life that is yours. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. I invite you this day to share Christ's peace with those you care about, your neighbors, your friends, or even right here on our video. Some announcements for you this morning. A reminder that today is a busy day here at Good Shepherd. We gathered at 9 a.m. for our first gathering in the Word of the Day. We will be offering drive through Holy Communion at 10 a.m. in the church parking lot for those who are interested in coming to receive Holy Communion this day uh, without necessarily being around a lot of people. We also will have our digital refreshment hour on Zoom at 10 a.m. And there is still space for our second gathering in the Word this evening at 7 o'clock. If you would like to attend, you can register through the church website. It is God's Work Our Hands Sunday, and while that looks much different for us this year, we are still celebrating what it looks like for us to do God's work in this world in the ways in which we are called. And so today we will be restocking our food pantry, and we are collecting just some final school supplies to hand out to students in our community this year. So if you are coming to the church for a drive through communion or gathering in the Word, I do invite you to bring some items with you. If you would like to, uh, you can also drop those items off throughout the week. There is a bin for school supplies out front and food items can be dropped off on Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. The items we are looking for for the food pantry specifically are tuna, peanut butter and jelly, canned vegetables, soup, cereal, pasta sauce, not pasta, we've got lots of pasta, toilet paper, soap and toiletries, and laundry detergent. And we are still looking for crayons, composition notebooks, and lined packs of lined paper for school supplies for this year. You will note that our Wednesday Bible study is back on track for this year, and so we will be gathering on Wednesdays at noon. All are welcome. We do gather on Zoom, and the link is sent in the Monday Zoom email. And we make our way through the Sunday scriptures and reflect and look at them, uh, reflect on and look at them before Sunday worship on Wednesdays at noon. 
You will note that the women of Good Shepherd are having a book discussion this coming Thursday, September 17th. So there's still time to get the book and read it quickly if you'd like to participate. They will be on Zoom on Thursday at 2 o'clock. The regular Saturday morning book discussion is continuing to meet. And so their next gathering will be Saturday, September 26th. Please join them on Zoom at 930. Even if you've not been in on the Zoom meetings for this book prior to now, you can always join and then catch up for the next book as well. Diakonia will be having an information night this Thursday, September 17th at 7 o'clock p.m. on Zoom. And I do invite you, if you're interested in learning more about the Diakonia program, to take a some time and join them to hear more. We are still collecting empty coffee cans so that we can deliver our lovely altar flowers to members of our congregation while we are away. And so if you have empty coffee cans, my coffee drinkers, please uh, feel free to drop those off on the bench out front by the Narthex doors. Uh, any day of the week is fine. With that, we will continue our worship for this morning. We pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. The things which are forbidden are often the most tempting, and we seem to love pursuing them. Stand between us and our shame, that we might choose instead a path of joy and freedom, and live in the grace which you have offered. God of compassion, hear our prayer. Bless all grandparents, those who care for and love their children's children, those who serve as surrogate elder mentors, and those who long for grandchildren but do not have any. Strengthen ties between generations that each might be blessed and enriched by the other. God of compassion, hear our prayer. Loving Creator, you have given us this great garden of earth to till and keep. May we resist the temptation to exploit and misuse it out of greed or possessiveness choosing instead to cultivate its beauty and share its fruits equitably and justly. God of compassion, hear our prayer. So many people are burdened with shame over events long past. Help us all to release what no longer serves us and be open to your renewing love. Send your healing to all who need it, especially those we name before you now. God of compassion, hear our prayer. Receive these prayers and all those which we offer in silence for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God, the Creator, Jesus, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. <laughs>
Go in peace, serve the Lord. We will. Thanks be to God.